The Willow Woman, chapter one. In the near distance, in the gray light of dawn, Philip E.A. saw her plodding toward him on the other side of the road. A giantess, a veritable woman mountain, not an ounce of fat on her, at least a head higher than most everybody else. The mass of people, traveling directly to work or first taking their children to school, flowed about this woman, a slow-moving river around a large boulder. Few made eye contact with her. Those who did looked away quickly, not liking what they saw, wanting nothing to do with her. She moved closer, seemingly not in any hurry, her eyes flicking this way and that. She scrutinized everyone and everything about her, the pedestrians, the street vendors and road sweepers, the cars, buses, mopeds and cargo tricycles driving by. She reminded him of a very old story told by the Venetian traveller, merchant and arch fantasist Marco Polo. The story concerned a Tartar princess named Ayaruk, which means bright moon. The princess, so the story goes, had such physical strength and possessed a mind of such independent bent that she had agreed only ever to marry that rare man who could beat best her in a bout of wrestling. There had been many contenders, but Philip A. was at a loss to recall if any had proved worthy. He smiled at his remembrance of this remarkable tale, wondering if indeed any part of it was true. That Marco Polo had actually reached China he thought possible, if not necessarily probable. But which of Marco Polo's many stories were actual reportage, or hearsay, or downright fantasy, he was not knowledgeable enough to say. What he did know was that the woman moving toward him was most unusual. He also knew what she was, and that it was she he had come to find. A few hours before, Philip E.A. had woken, the sky still dark and the air about him gone chill. He had fallen asleep while reading, the lamp at the side of his bed still illuminating the room with a dull yellow glow. There was fresh smoke in the air, an aromatic tobacco, fruit scented, seething under the door. As always during the night, his father was up and about, smoking his pipe, wandering the great house. He could hear his father's voice, just a faint murmur, speaking, he presumed, on the telephone. But it was not his father who had disturbed his sleep. With the familiar feeling of the hairs rising on the back of his neck, Philippe E.A. rolled out of bed, drew a silk dressing gown about him and took a seat in his favourite leather armchair. He closed his eyes and began to breathe. He held it to be a truth that the rate at which thoughts cross the mind is directly proportional to the rate of respiration. If the breathing is slowed and regulated, so the mind is slowed and regulated. And when the mind is regulated, so the emotions are diminished and the fear that lurks within is brought under control. Inhale, counting eight heartbeats. Hold for four heartbeats. Exhale for eight heartbeats. He repeated the cycle. And then again, he whispered to himself, in breath there is life, in breath there is serenity, in breath there is clarity. He opened his eyes. In the centre of the room stood a translucent figure, a ghost, an old man blinking, as if surprised by this encounter with the physical world. Unsure, it seemed, not only of his whereabouts, but also about what he was doing here. Philip E.A. pushed aside all thought of the Chinese unwritten rule of millennia. The living were the living, and the dead were the dead, and never the twain should meet, and opened his mouth to speak. I am Philip E.A., a superintendent of the People's Police. How may I be of service to you? The old man frowned, more definite in form and in purpose now. He pointed to the north. Wu Kui Shi, you must go to Wu Kui Shi. That is where you will find her. The old man disappeared then, still pointing toward the north as he faded from view. Wu Kui Shi was an area in the north of the city, in the Jinu district, famous for its tea market but little else. Philip telephoned his friend Rao. Any trade tonight? No. Wu Kui Shi? Not that I've heard. Bad dreams? Can't sleep? Something like that. Philip EA terminated the call. He checked the clock. It was a few minutes after four. He showered and shaved quickly. Was time of the essence? He didn't know. He selected a dark blue wool suit, cream silk shirt, 
crimson tie and handmade black patent leather shoes polished to a brilliant shine. A pale grey raincoat to finish, he briefly examined his appearance in the tall mirror before exiting his rooms. His father was nowhere to be seen, but he found Nightnar lounging in a comfortable seat in the main sitting room, some kind of investment magazine open before him. Where's the fire? Nightnar asked. In fine humour, he showed almost every one of his teeth. Wu Kwai Shi, Philip E.A. replied, not stopping to chat. It was pointless trying to explain. He closed the front door behind him and, with the night mist swirling around him, jumped into the Mercedes. As he steered out of the long driveway and headed north, he picked up his phone and dialed, a sense of dread in his heart, a feeling that a tragedy was imminent, impossible to divert. Wu Kwai Shi Police Station? This is Superintendent EA, homicide. Any trouble? No, sir, but if you wish to speak to... Philip EA dropped the phone on the seat and concentrated on his driving. His destination was a long way off, the other side of the city. He pushed the car onward, the early morning traffic not yet heavy enough to slow him down. Wu Kwai Shi was not exactly a small area. Once there, he would have to make a decision about where to go, where to park up and wait. And, if his intuition gave him nothing at all, then, well, he crossed that bridge when he came to it. No ghost had ever misdirected him before. After what seemed an age of driving and of gnawing indecision, he finally parked up on the Yusai Road, happy at least to find a space, somewhere to be still for a while, to breathe, to think, to contemplate just what it was the ghost had said. He was to look for a woman, or maybe a girl. But what was she? Victim? Witness or criminal? Briefly, he stepped out of the car to look about him, to stretch his legs, to get a feel for the area. It had been some time since he had been in this part of the city. However, he soon got back into the car, disliking the exhaust fumes in his nostrils and the clamour of the awakening city around him. He closed the door, happier in his mechanical cocoon. He rubbed his tired eyes and settled himself down to wait. It was after seven, his patience almost at an end, when he spotted in the distance across the road, through the gaps in the passing traffic, the largest woman he had ever seen. It offended him that she was dressed so poorly, faded smock, ill-fitting jeans, knock-off Nike training shoes that looked as if they'd already walked a thousand miles. But, while he was reflecting on her lack of care for herself, a commotion caught his eye across the road from him. He twisted in his seat to get a better look, wrenching his neck in the process. An old man was holding a long knife aloft while clasping a young girl to him, trapping her in the crook of his free arm. The girl, in a pretty school uniform, at most eight or nine years old, was hysterical, screeching, struggling to get free. Nearby, a young woman, just as hysterical, whom Philip E.A. took to be her mother, cried out to the passers-by for help. Philip E.A. had time to move, to intervene, he could have jumped out of the car and run across the road in seconds. But he recognised the old man. He thought him already dead, the exact physical likeness of his ghostly visitor from only a few hours before. And that recognition gave him pause, glued him to his seat. How was this possible? Had his ghostly visitor an identical twin? The old man was shouting. Philip E.A. couldn't hear him above the din of the traffic and from within the safety of the car. Frozen in his seat, his neck twisted round at a painful angle, Philip A. could only watch the violence unfold, the old man waving the knife around like a crazy man. Then, pop, pop, the old man fell, his face contorted in mid-shout, bright red arterial blood pumping from wounds that had blossomed suddenly on the side of his head. The young girl, still screaming, disentangled herself from the old man as he fell to be caught in the waiting, outstretched arms of her distraught mother. Then the giantess was there, leaning over the old man, pistol in hand, staring down at the now lifeless body, her expression blank, blank puzzled even, devoid of any emotion. A truck pulled up to a halt behind, beside the Mercedes, obscuring the scene. Not that it mattered. Philip E.A. had already closed his eyes and settled back into his seat to ponder all that had just transpired. And so ends chapter one.